Marcos. Florian. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. I'm uh, very excited to speak and discuss superconductors with you and describe what they are and what they can provide for the industry. So just to begin, what we'll briefly go through is who Supernode are, what, what we're actually developing ourselves, what's occurring in the elect electricity industry today, what superconductivity is, because it is a phenomenon that not many are aware of, uh, and where they exist in today's market, not just in the uh, grid infrastructure, but in other areas of the market. And, and finally, what do they offer and how are we taking advantage of it? So who are Supernodes? I guess our, our mission is to decarbonize the global economy through the harnessing of the best renewables resources available. Uh, and this is not always easy to achieve and not in the easiest areas. So Supernode was founded just over two years ago by Eddie O'Connor, who some might be aware of as the executive chairman of Mainstream Renewable Power. Our chairman of the board is Pat Cox, a former president of the EU Parliament. And finally, John Fitzgerald is our CEO. He's a vast amount of experience in grid development uh, with Airgrid, the Irish TSO here. So why are we looking at new transmission technology? I'm sure everyone is aware of uh, a lot of the ongoing scenario analysis, both from the commission and external uh, consultants uh, of what is expected for the future. But electricity demand is going to grow. It's going to increase in its share of energy demand. And as a result, there will be an increased demand for uh, renewable energy capacity to be constructed. So in particular, we see a keen interest in the offshore uh, capacity required, as well as the level of on, uh, onshore solar being built. So these are two huge numbers, as we can see on the slide here, 450 gigawatts of, of offshore wind when you include the UK in the EU, and uh, up to 1,000 uh, gigawatts of capacity required of solar by 2050. Um, as we know, you know, a lot of these uh, renewable resources are available in the peripheries of Europe. So obviously the northern seas are, are prime for offshore wind development as well as good onshore resource. And then the southern regions of, of Europe uh, have the, the, the best solar resource. We're seeing a lot of work coming out now from in particular universities and institutions showing the benefits of a coordinated approach and a more integrated future grid. So what's required now is the actual transmission capacity technologies to facilitate this development. So what is superconductivity? So superconductivity is a phenomenon which occurs when a material is cooled below a critical temperature uh, under which it displays zero electrical resistance, high power density and low electro electromagnetic fields. So the key task here is getting finding these materials and getting them to these temperatures, which are often as low as uh, minus 200 degrees Celsius and in certain circumstances even lower again. So when we look at what these uh, properties offer as a benefit to the uh, industry, in particular, the zero electrical resistance jumps out. When you look at conventional HVDC, uh, when you look at over a thousand kilometers stretch, you look at losses of potentially five to 6% um, spanning that stretch. This doesn't even account for the losses, say in AC, which cannot go over these types of diff distances without going overhead. With regards to the high power density, you have a potential to carry increased levels of current, but maintain more manageable uh, voltage levels in the system itself. Uh, this is obviously vital in particular in, in reducing the footprint of the electrical equipment required at either end of the scheme. Uh, this is reflected in the smaller right of way as well, where when you increase the capacities to the, the gigawatt scales, uh, two gigawatts plus, uh, the, the footprint of the cable itself or the cable corridor decreases drastically as you are capable of running a single pair of poles or bipole configuration with uh, superconductors, whereas conventional cables may require uh, multiple of poles uh, by poles to actually carry the same level of power. And then finally, the lower cost. This is a, a especially seen as you increase the capacities again, where there is a smaller uh, number of cables required for the superconducting project, whereas the, the conventional cables may require high levels of, 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 of uh, cables. And this is all vital and important in particular as we start looking at these larger schemes being developed. Uh, currently, the likes of the two gigawatt schemes being developed, but in the future where higher capacities will be needed in the grid. So this environmental impact of the transmission infrastructure will become a more important and vital aspect of the project itself. So just to touch a bit more on this footprint, uh, the, the image on the right is just an example of the Sudlink being built in Germany. So as it's stated at the moment in the project, the spacing between cables will be about 10 meters between each poles, and it will require two sets of bipoles of 525 kV cables. So you can see the difference in footprint between the conventional system as it would exist uh, in the project today versus a superconductor, which again is capable of carrying this four gigawatt power, but only using two cables. And most importantly, uh, as we discussed, is the capability of operating at a much lower voltage, which would be in and around 100 kV. 
So the, the, the key thing to consider as to why this footprint can be smaller is as a result of the no excess heat. Uh, the electrical resistance is related to some of the heat dissipation from the conventional cables. So the spacing is required to allow this heat to dissipate into the surrounding area and allow the cable to continue operating as expected. The, the final uh, point um, for the, the spacing itself is just the electromagnetic fields generated by conventional copper cables. Uh, this is not an issue with superconducting cables, so they are capable of being spaced closer together. You also, of course, have um, some the public perception around EMFs in particular. Uh, this is not an issue, something that is considered for superconductors. So where do superconductors exist today? I'm going to start just with some wind turbine examples as they're quite interesting to see it developing in, in its normal use case of magnets. So the EcoSwing project was a, a horizon project that was built uh, a few years ago now, which took an existing two bladed uh, demonstration turbine and retrofitted the generator with a superconducting alternative. Uh, the benefits were vast and uh, just as a result of consideration given to the superconducting coils and its ability to have a much higher uh, current density than the conventional generator before it. The result of this, as well as um, the, the improved magnetic uh, fields in, the, in the, the generator itself, resulted in the generator uh, reducing its volume by approximately 25% compared to the previous older generator, and the actual weight of the generator uh, decreasing by 40%, resulting in a net uh, decrease of 25% for the nacelle as a whole. These are, of course, advantages uh, when, as we're increasing the scale of turbines that, that are really interesting uh, to the industry. And this was picked up on in the US. The Department of Energy put out a call back in 2019 looking at designs for 15 megawatt turbines, uh, two designs of which from GE, an American superconductor, put forward uh, high temperature and low temperature superconducting designs. In January this year, GE actually received further funding for their design on the low temperature superconducting turbine. And this is something they expect to have a prototype generator um, operating by mid-2023, so we're really interested to see the results of this as it shows superconductors uh, emerging in a new area uh, today. With regards to superconductors in the grid today, we have a, a host of projects. Uh, one I don't mention in this presentation, but the likes of Best Pads, again another a European funded project that showed a stretch of cable tested in, in um, lab conditions uh, to show a, a capacity over three gigawatts uh, within the cable itself. And that was at a relatively high voltage of about 320 kV. Uh, but we have more interesting results that are occurring in, in a real world um, example, such as the Ampassi project in Essen, Germany. So this was an issue where there was a, a substation that was over capacity and required a freeing up of capacity and, and alleviation of issues. And a transformer was not capable of being built nearby to assist uh, that substation's operation. As a result, some of the universities pr provided um, some solutions, alternative solutions, and a, and a call was made, a decision was made to use a low, uh, a low temperature superconducting system here in the, the project. And this allowed for a, a more compact footprint through the urban dense uh, scenario out to a new substation built out towards the, the suburbs. And this project has been up and running since 2014. Uh, it's operated reliably. It was intentionally um, made for three years, but has uh, remained in operation as a result of its, its high degree of reliability. The next project to mention is the Shingle project, which was the first fully commercial project built in, in Seoul, South Korea. And it was built um, with KEPCO, the, the local TSO, and LS Cables at the time. And similar to the issue seen in Essen, Germany, there was a requirement for some capacity being freed up in a dense situation, a dense urban scenario where conventional cables could not offer a solution. As a result, a slightly higher voltage than the Ampassi project um, superconductor at 23 kV uh, was constructed as a first phase of the project. So that the, the superconductor was actually found to be cheaper in the scenario and has led to LS Cables and Kepco exploring a higher uh, capacity project um, for Seoul as well um, and to further develop superconductors for the Korean market. So what is Supernode developing then? Um, well, we saw an opportunity in particular as, as Europe continues to decarbonize, but on a global scale that the offshore is, is changing in, in how things work. Uh, we see an opportunity where point to point connections are becoming somewhat outdated and the future will tend towards more shared infrastructure and, and a coordinated approach. As a result, the scale and capacity of these projects is going to increase. And today transmission represents sometimes over 30% of the cost of building an offshore wind farm. It's something that we see that isn't seeing huge cost decreases, 
and we'd like to see that occur uh, with the technology itself dropping annually. We, we want transmission to also follow this trend and reduce the cost of energy for offshore wind. So where we see the space for superconductors, uh, we have superconductors labeled here as SMVDC, as it will be operating at a medium voltage of about 100 kilovolts. It compares to the existing HVDC infrastructure, which goes up as far as about two gigawatts um, operating at 525 kV, and then the ultra HVDC, which is considered above that voltage level up as high as 800 kV. So the crossover point we see for superconductors where their benefits are truly exemplified is above two gigawatts in scale. So how it looks and where the benefits come now is in the voltage levels. So on the top, you can see what is considered a conventional two gigawatt scheme. Uh, we see this in some of the wind series platforms in the German North Sea, where uh, wind farms are now connecting straight into a joint substation and converter station before it is transported back to land using conventional DC cables. For a superconducting scheme, uh, the, the intention is that these turbines could operate in a DC array format, connecting into a single offshore bus bar where the, the voltage level remains at 100 kV, but the current levels are increased before being transported back to line on a single pair of cables. Uh, the benefits that we see here that superconductors facilitate is the ability to shrink the size of the offshore platform down drastically. So what are the competitors really to the in the offshore? Uh, you have the existing schemes like the, the one shown here in the Darwin 3. Uh, there are huge uh, man-made islands being considered as well, but the, the costs and the challenges with regards to the sourcing the material required uh, are, are vast. Um, you also have things as just DC arrays by themselves using conventional cables being explored. Uh, there was a recent presentation from some institutions showing the benefits there, but you are then limited by capacity, as well as uh, the uncertainty of the number of cables uh, reaching landfall. And then finally, there is the option of, of, of using offshore energy to produce hydrogen and that be transported back to land. Uh, but there is, of course, the issue of actually producing it in the offshore environment, as well as the, the efficiency um, of the, the hydrogen process as a whole. So I'd like to just highlight the scale difference, really, in the, the platform um, between a conventional converter station, so this based off the Darwin 3, and the supernode converter station or collector station. So that the size difference is vast um, and in the offshore environment, the size of the platform really does dictate a huge cost and that is all driven by the voltage levels chosen for these schemes. And so as we now tend from the, the, the existing 320 kV systems into the 525 kV systems, the platforms are increasing drastically in size and the cost of these platforms as well as the electrical equipment is rising drastically. So Supernode has for the, the past year or so been working with a Scottish university um, just on some cost benefit analysis work as well as some other modeling work on the use of DC schemes. Uh, this work is going to be published in the next coming weeks. Hopefully we will have it on our website as well as some other work that is undergoing a peer review to be published in a, in a conference paper. But the, the summary of the results shown um, in a comparison between a 525 kV system as is being considered for future uh, shared transmission schemes in the German and, and Dutch North Seas, uh, compared to a MVDC solution using superconductors, it, it shows a potential for the superconducting system to be 35% cheaper over the lifetime of the project. Uh, and that's nothing to be to sniffled at, uh, considering the cost of these infrastructure, if infrastructure projects runs into the billions. So a 35% saving has a huge effect on the cost of energy itself. So when we look at the actual superconducting materials, what are the choices available? I mentioned earlier that at GE, we're working on a low temperature superconductor. So what this is considered is any material that shows superconducting properties below the temperature of 30 degrees Kelvin or minus 230 degrees Celsius. And um, so the, the most common material chosen here is a material called magnesium diboride or MGB2. Uh, this is something that is challenging. You require very uh, tough to, to find materials or fluids to be used as the, the cryogenic coolant for the system itself. More recently, there was the development of high temperature superconductors and don't be confused by the name. They're not very high temperature. It's anything considered between 30 and 77 degrees Kelvin. So some of the more common materials here are the likes of Repco or Bisco, which are two materials that are currently used and under development. Uh, within these, then you have, of course, the different generations, in particular with high temperature superconductors, which are normally a mix of materials. Uh, you have developments in how these materials are mixed, how they're developed, how they're produced in the tape. And as a result, we are now looking at the second generation of these tapes, which offer a cheaper, more easily produced tape um, that is often more readily available as well uh, to the market.
So when Supernode was looking at these materials, we looked at a few different aspects as to what is important to driving the cost down. So as you can imagine, the temperatures involved, one of the most uh, uh, vital areas to, to consider really is the cooling requirement of the system and the availability of the, the material itself. So the graph on the right shows a comparison of just some of the materials we considered uh, a, a summary, I guess, of the analysis we performed on, on these materials and what we believe to be the key areas of discussion. So the HTS materials with a, a lower um, uh, cooling requirement, of course, became more important to us and that they, they're they were something that were considered to be more accessible to the market and potentially be um, um, more reliable as well as you require less cooling in the system and more readily available cooling uh, fluids such as liquid nitrogen. So what about the costs of the materials themselves? Well, at the moment there is a, a relatively niche market for them. As I mentioned, they're only being introduced into the, the consideration for wind turbine generator design. They are slowly entering the distribution level market and their only other use case really is in magnets used for MRI machines and specialized cases such as the likes of CERN and fusion reactor projects. So at the moment demand exists at about a thousand kilometers of uh, superconducting tape per annum. So relatively low. One of the drivers really at the moment um, for the, the adoption of, of the, the tape is just this high cost of tape at about 130 euro per kiloamp meter. So what we want to do is bring this cost down, but this can only occur through higher adoption in the market. Um, as this uh, increase of, of demand occurs, there is potential for more economies of scale to be realized through the manufacturing process itself. Um, we are not concerned with the tape uh, manufacturing ourselves. That, that's a supply chain uh, concern, but it's something we are conscious of and are looking to progress in particular. But through this um, increase in demand, as well as um, uh, developments in the supply chain itself, we see that the cost of superconducting tape, in particular the ones we are interested in, uh, reaching as low as 30 euro per kilowatt meter by 2030, uh, using just existing demand today, in particular for distribution level, as well as some uh, scale-up projects that we are, we are seeing for the future. So what are the challenges for the tape and what do we see us for us as the challenges for the system as a whole? Well, we are dealing with a cable system that is not passive like a copper cable. There are active elements to the, the project. You have a cooling and pumping station that pumps uh, the liquid nitrogen um, at its cryogenic temperatures uh, to maintain the temperature of, of the system as a whole. So developing a reliable cooling system and pumping station um, is urgent for, for this project. It's something that exists as an isolated scheme by itself, but putting it in together with the superconducting system as a whole is the challenge. You've also got the aspect of developing the actual pipe itself or the cryostat as it's called, um, that is cheap, but also reliable and robust for the, env uh, for the offshore environment. So looking at some unique and interesting materials there for the development of the cryostat is something that Supernode is, is conscious of. With regards to the actual demonstration of these projects, it can be challenging. When we discuss the benefits we've mentioned of superconductors, we're discussing capacities in the gigawatt scale. So demonstrating these projects at that scale is, is impossible, but moving forward in the offshore environment and, and showing them using offshore connection is, is vital. So finding projects that are capable of, of uh, showing these DC advantages are, are huge. Uh, with regards to industry collaboration, we're, we're seeing, I guess, in the previous year in particular, an, an increase in interest from industry for alternatives to, to grid solutions. Um, innovation in the grid has been more challenging. A lot of it has been more towards the optimization and line rating side of things rather than to the infrastructure itself. And we're trying to find more people that are motivated um, in this area uh, to drive the cost down. As I mentioned, a 30% share of, of an offshore wind farm is it, cost is, is down to the transmission aspect itself. And then finally, uh, when we look at the tape itself, as, as we're not involved in the manufacturing of tape ourselves, it's, it's establishing a secure and reliable supply chain. Some of the materials required for superconducting tape are found in more uh, politically turbulent areas of the world. So uh, ensuring that these materials can be reliably sourced and, and manufactured into a tape for use in these projects is really vital for, for the project as a whole. So I'd like to finish my, my, my slides just on, on one quote from the recent Clean Energy Transition Technologies and Innovations Report released by the European Commission, who said it would be beneficial to develop high temperature superconducting technologies for superconducting transmission lines to explore its potential in situations where very high amounts of power need to be transmitted. High capacity is suited to superconductors. We need to develop the technology to facilitate future grid connections. Thank you very much.
Marcos, thank you very much for your presentation. Very insightful indeed, uh, even though it goes uh, quite deep in the te technology that it's been conducting and so on. Um, I like also the way you frame it towards the end, all the challenges that we've seen, right? You started very well with where we are today, how, um, what kind of efforts we do. Uh, one quick question from my side before uh, the audience kick in here and then fills in the, uh, the chat window is really uh, to me it's, it's enlightening to see that such a you know I would call it significant technology development could have such a broad impact on the overall system and we are looking here as a system right as let's consider a wind farm but also the, the grid behind the wind farm and, and getting it all done. Um, and that is sometimes very difficult to kind of assess the whole impact, right? And take strategic decisions to really jump on a new technology and without really doing it the, the let's let's say it's the traditional way. Oh, do I have a business case? Uh, how do I develop it? Yes, I get positive on one project or another project. Yes, I have. Um, capital from whatever sources of, of financing and so on. Um, the question is on, on this, let's say, complexity of, of, of driving things and, and seeing the impact of the technology. How have you seen the, let's say, response from all the stakeholders have you discussed with, right? And how would you quantify the, let's say, willingness of some of the stakeholders of a particular industry to really change the technology. What are the main barriers that you see right there? Right? Are we talking technologies? Are we talking business cases? Are we talking whatever we are talking? Can you elaborate on that, please? I think when we look at the, the technology side of things, discussions with the supply chain and manufacturers of some of the systems that we're interested in, there, there is a real appetite really to, to progress this. Um, they, they have experience in, in some of the other areas I'd mentioned, in particular with MRI machines, but see the potential for it in the grid. Um, so I, I think from industry, there's a real willingness there to, to progress the concepts. Uh, I, I believe the challenges for us lie more in a, a regulatory and, and political landscape um, where you know, when Supernode was first founded, one of the, the concepts that we wanted to progress was the idea of a European supergrid. That's something that we saw as, as the long term goal and something at the time that might have been looked at as a bit far fetched by people. Um, but now, you know, two years later, through, you know, lots of in interaction with, with stakeholders in, in the political uh, landscape as well as industry, uh, we see the, the, the acceptance and nearly the, the uh, implementation or future planning for meshed grids in particular. So that's one aspect we see superconductors going into. Uh, when we start chatting to more uh, stakeholders as well, in particular on the, the customer side of things, such as some developers, uh, as well as some TSOs, there is a growing appetite. There is, a, um, I guess, a worry nearly that the current technology may limit the adoption of, of renewables to meet 2030 goals. So all of a sudden we have some TSOs that we discussed with that are, are now uh, more inclined to look at these more innovative solutions um, into their grids where previously they, they may have had more of a focus on um, reliable, established, proven um, technologies. So the, the, the appetite for innovation in the grid market is, is growing at the moment and, and it's something we hope to continue pushing um, through continued interaction with all the many stakeholders involved. Um, in particular, you know, grid scale projects, they're not built in a year and um, they are things that require you know, sometimes 10 years and, and longer um, to plan, develop and, and construct. Very well, and if we stay on, on that um, readiness of technology, there is a question here. Could you quantify at which uh, TRL, so technology readiness level, super, uh, superconductors are today for this kind of application? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I, I'm sure people may have seen that that NSOE recently re released their Technopedia uh, and they themselves consider um, uh, superconducting temp uh, systems to be in and around a, a, a TRL level of about six to eight uh, in the AC environment and around five to six in the DC environment. Um, so this is as a result of some of the, the distribution scale projects. With respect to our product, which is more focused in the offshore to begin with, um, we consider it to be somewhere around TRL3 uh, many of the subsystems that are higher TRL levels, but the, the challenge really is integrating all these subsystems together to, to combine into the superconducting system. Mm. 
Good, and that is another question here with quite some votes and then and goes back to our earlier discussion this morning about uh, rare, else, uh, rare earths elements, right? Is how much of those you need for um, realizing your system? It's it's tough to qualify quantify as a number. I, I don't think I can share that information, but it is it is an issue we we are focusing on. Um, it's something we see not just as a, a concern for for our industry or for our product, but for the wind industry as a whole, where rare earths are under uh, high demand and, of course, so sourced from um, challenging areas of the world. Um, so we are looking at alternative tapes in particular that might reduce the the quantity of rare earth required. Um, but that that's something that's I guess under development for for our product for the future. Mm. And the last question here before we move to our next presentation is related with cryogenics and the you know uh, the system around the conductors to to keep it cool. Right? Are there environmental concerns about it in case of leakages? Maybe we are talking about offshore applications here and go, reversing in the water, but even in the soil and and so on. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah. It's it's something we are very conscious of. Um, you know, we mentioned the environmental impact and our concern, I guess, in particular with with um, what exists today with respect to copper cables. And um, if there were to be a leakage, if there were to be a leakage of liquid nitrogen, it's it's not harmful to the environment. Uh, when you look at air, about seventy eight percent, seventy nine percent of air is is nitrogen. Um, we it's not an environmental issue. And um, the only concern that we're investigating further is the effect of leakage, obviously, of this cryogenic temperature. Um, and how that affects the surrounding environment. In an onshore environment, it, it wouldn't have a major uh, um, issue. Uh, it, it's a relatively small radius of impact, but in the offshore environment uh, where you're dealing with water and potential instant freezing of water, that's something we're in investigating further. Very good. And once again, Marcos, uh, thanks a lot for being with us today and for the insights um, on superconducting. We are now moving with to our next and the last um, speaking presentation.